Okay, um, I'll get started. So this talks on verifiable delay functions. Uh, and it's actually uh, quite relevant to the talk that Bram just gave on, on proof of space because Bram has this nice idea of combining uh, proofs of space with verifiable delay functions in order to have a blockchain consensus protocol. So this is joint work with um, my co-authors, uh, Benedict and uh, Dan Bonnet here at Stanford, and Joseph Bonneau, who's a professor at NYU. So what is a verifiable delay function? Informally first. So it's a function that goes from some space x to some space y. But we want it to be a function that takes a long time to compute, not just, not just in terms of its time complexity in the computational sense, but actually in terms of the wall clock time that it takes to derive an output on a given input x. And on top of that, on the other hand, given an output in the target space y, and perhaps a short proof along with a pre-image x, it should be easy to verify very quickly, there should be some algorithm for verifying very quickly that indeed the function uh, evaluated on x is equal to y. Okay, so that there has to be this asymmetry between evaluating in one direction that takes a long wall clock time to compute and is quick to verify. It's not, uh, you know, so what, what do we mean by wall, wall clock time? Right, so a, a problem can have very, very high complexity, right? Like, for example, problems in NP have very high complexity and they're easy to verify. But we want this to be slow, so we want it to be a sequential computation. So even someone with many, you know, parallel resources can't speed up the computation. On the other hand, the inversion should have low complexity. So it should be an efficient verification, not simply due to parallelization, right? We want the verifier to not even have to have uh, too many computational resources in order to, to do this. Some other desirable properties that we want are for it to be publicly verifiable, so it's not just one party with some kind of trapdoor can verify, but anybody can verify. And we want it to be tunable so that we can put in different delay parameters so we can adjust the amount of time that uh, it should take to compute a given function. Or for any given delay parameter, we should be able to have a function that takes that amount of time to compute and is still quick to verify. So there's a number of very related cryptography concepts that have been around for quite a while. Uh, so one of them is time lock puzzles. In time lock puzzles, some private verifier produces a puzzle that then a, a prover is going, to, um, is going to solve and it will take the prover a long time to solve it because they don't know the private information that went into generating that puzzle. But the problem is that they're not publicly verifiable. They could be publicly verifiable with a trusted setup, but it would require a trusted setup for every single puzzle, right? So every time you would want the prover to, to run a time lock puzzle, you would have to have a new setup. And so we can use that to build a VDF, which is a function, just a function, that on any given random input takes a long time to compute without having to redo the setup. Proofs of sequential work are also relevant. They are publicly verifiable. Uh, there are constructions that do not even involve the trusted setup. But they're not a function, right? It, the con known constructions of proofs of sequential work, there could be multiple valid proofs. They, they all take a long time to compute, but it's not a function from one space to another. There isn't a unique output for a given challenge. So let me motivate why we would be interested in, in, in such a strange thing. It's not just good enough to have a, a, a proof of sequential work, but actually something that's a function, that has a unique output. So one motivating application um, is a random beacon. Uh, it's kind of amazing that, so in cryptography, we haven't really solved the problem of trusted public randomness. Like we're, maybe we're good at generating random numbers, but if you're going to run a lottery, and that 
the, 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 somebody is going to have to run the lottery and choose the winning ticket, how does everybody who's participating in the lottery know that that ticket was actually selected honestly? Right? How, how do we, we, we at massively at scale publicly verify that a random number was truly selected randomly? So this concept of a random beacon uh, was coined by uh, um, Rabin in 1981, but it's of course a much older concept. It's just the idea of an ideal service that, that would publish random values which no party can predict or manipulate. So this is an example from, uh, from uh, you can watch this on YouTube, a lottery where, you know, there was, a, there, was, there was on video this public display of the balls being selected random, the balls, you know, moving around in the machine and coming out at random, but um, the numbers, the winning numbers were actually displayed before all the balls were drawn. So clearly something funny is going on here. So there are, you know, a, several approaches have been suggested for random beacons. One is multi-party protocols. Instead of having one party who you trust, can you distribute that trust over multiple parties? So there's multi-party coin tossing protocols. They work if one third of the participants are honest. There's uh, these com this commit and reveal idea where many different parties send commitments to their random values. And then there's an opening phase where everybody opens their random values and the output's just taken as an XOR or some kind of combination of them. Uh, the problem is that even in the commit and reveal protocols, you can always choose not to reveal after, everybody, after, after you've already seen everybody else reveal. And in, a colluding fraction can actually manipulate this quite significantly because they could have influence, so if like K participants could have influence over two to the K possible, um, possible outputs. So that doesn't quite work. There's public displays of randomness, uh, you know, coin tossing in front of people, rolling dice. They're not easy to verify. There's, you know, because of sleight of hand, like we saw in the, in the video example before. And they're, and they're especially difficult to deploy in a trustworthy way at scale, um, where, you know, you're displaying something on video. Who knows? Uh, so there's also the idea of using public sources of entropy, uh, such as stock, market prices, the low order bits of stock market prices are thought of as, as hard to predict, especially over a long period of time. And um, blockchain headers, proof of work solutions contain entropy, right? It's the, the, basically the, ha the, the, the pre-image of, of, of a certain hash target. Um, and uh, the problem with both of these approaches are that they still are manipulatable to some degree. So like high frequency trading firms can try to manipulate even the low order bits of stock market prices. Uh, and with blockchain headers, a miner may withhold unfavorable solutions if they really care about the outcome of a lottery that depends on it. Um, so people have suggested, you know, that the, the, have looked into this approach of, of extracting randomness from a, from a blockchain. Uh, so estimates say that there, you know, block, uh, blocks in Bitcoin have a, at least 70 bits of, of computational min entropy, so you can extract that. But again, this problem is that a miner might withhold. So the suggestion uh, that has been proposed was to add some kind of delay to the derivation of, a random, of the random beacon from the block. So the block will first be posted, and then it will take several blocks later until we know what the actual random beacon value is. So the idea is that a miner can't predict the, how his block will influence the random beacon, and so there will be very low incentive to withhold. Right? Basically, if they withhold, then the blockchain will have already moved on by the time uh, they come up with a new solution. Another application that I'll sketch at a very high level, and this is uh, related to, th this is basically Bram's idea for how to combine proofs of, uh, proofs of space with VDFs to achieve a, a workable consensus protocol. But I'll present it sort of more, gen more generally in terms of a proof of resource. Uh, and this is a very cool idea, that you can actually use these VDFs to compile any proof of resource into 
a, proof, a type of proof of, of, of resource that you can use for blockchain consensus. Uh, I'm glossing over a lot of details here, but again, just at a high level, what we want is, okay, so let's say you have a proof of resource who proves that they own X percent of, of the total resources in some system. It could be space, it could be stake. What we would want is a consensus mechanism that has the property that a miner with X percent of the resources should, in expectation, mine X percent of the blocks in any chain window. And this is loosely referred to as chain quality. So the high-level idea is, well, if a, if a miner can prove that they own X percent of, a total, of the total resources, look at that as breaking it into X proofs of 1 percent of the resources. You're going to get X proofs. They all have to be distinct, right, because you can't, uh, it wouldn't be a proof of, of owning X percent of, of resources if, if, proofs, if two different proofs uh, for, for different portions of the resource were the, were the same. You have to distinguish between them. So you get X distinct proofs of 1% of the resources. And each distinct proof, you can think of giving you an independent random trial. You just put it through a hash function modeled as a random oracle to sample a uniform random value. And then the miner will find the minimum of all the random trials that he, that he was able to take. And then the miner would evaluate some verifiable delay function with a time delay that's proportional to this minimum value of his trials. And so the miner that wins is the one who samples the challenge that has the lowest delay parameter. So you have to look at, OK, well, what's the probability that a miner who owns x percent of the resources and gets x percent of the random trials will sample the lowest one? And that's going to be roughly x percent. So the, if you use this uh, as a blockchain mechanism, then over time in expectation, you'll expect that a probability who makes x percent, who has x percent of the resources and is making x percent of all random samples, will uh, have mined x percent of the blocks. So now let's go into constructions and formalisms of what uh, VDFs are, since that is the focus of this talk. So just some quick formalism and notation. Uh, we say that a VDF has a setup procedure that outputs public parameters. And this could specify the challenge space and, and the solution space of the VDF. There's variants of this. It could involve some kind of trusted setup, or it could be transparent and not involve any trusted setup. Then there is an eval algorithm. <clears throat> this is the thing that's supposed to take a long time. It takes a challenge and outputs a solution, along with some proof that the solution was derived correctly from the challenge. In some cases, there might not be a need for a proof, and it would just be an empty proof. But the important thing is that this is going to run in parallel time t, meaning even with parallel processors, it takes t sequential time to evaluate. t is the delay parameter that was part of the setup. Then you have a verification algorithm which takes in the proof and the public parameters, a given challenge and an output, and runs in total complexity polylog of t. So it's, there's an exponential gap in the, uh, well, at least asymptotically, we want there to be an exponential gap between the complexity of verification and evaluation. So the, uh, we, we need this property of uniqueness. We need to make sure that, the, that it's actually defining a function on the challenge space. And then there's this notion of sigma sequentiality, which formalizes the concept that there's no way of evaluating the eval function faster. There's no adversary, so to say, that can, on a given challenge, compute the solution with potentially polynomial in t number of processors in less than t minus some sigma of t uh, uh, steps. Um, and in this case, you, you think of, for example, if sigma was a constant, then we would have a very strict requirement that you can't compute it in t minus some constant number of steps. So in practice, you could probably relax some of these things. This is sort of the ideal uh, you know, theoretical VDF you could relax the requirements on, uh, on sigma sequentiality to say that 
no adversary with T squared processors or T cubed processors would be able to do this because in practice, if T is large, then maybe it's uh, you know fair to assume that there's nobody with a small polynomial of T number of processors. So let me give you an example of a sequential function, which is not a VDF, just to get us thinking in the right direction. So a hash chain, if you just iterate a hash function t times on a given um, input, right, you'll derive an output, and there's no way to speed up the computation of this problem, even given parallel resources. The problem is that it's not efficiently verifiable. The verification takes just as long as the evaluation. So one thing you might think is that, okay, well, what if we do a hash chain together with a snark or a proof that the computation was done correctly? This is known as, this is just generic verifiable computation. And you would compute a, we know that you can compute a succinct, succinct proof that you can quickly verify that the hash chain was computed correctly. The problem with this is that the computation of the snark proof on your hash chain is going to take longer than computing the hash chain itself. And moreover, the computation of the snark is highly parallelizable. So if the honest or if the, if, if, if the algorithm that, 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 that most people are running, right, is not highly, highly parallel and optimized, then it will take them at least two T steps to compute both the snark and the hash chain, whereas somebody with lots and lots of parallelism is going to take half the time. So there is a way to fix that, and theoretically, this does give our first theoretical VDF. There's something called incrementally verifiable computation, where instead of computing a snark on the entire chain, you incrementally update your proof as you're computing the chain. So after running your computation for, say, a few uh, number of blocks, you'll produce a proof, an incremental proof that you, that you did those first few blocks of your computation correctly. And then the next proof is going to prove that the next block was computed correctly and it will also verify the previous proof. So the proof at stage i is going to verify knowledge of a correct proof pi i minus one and also prove that the, that the i-th block of steps are computed correctly. And so this does work. This actually gives you a theoretical uh, VDF. Uh, if you're going to use snarks for this, notice that you would have a trusted setup for the snarks, but the, the trusted setup is relied on only for verifier efficiency, uh, not for the security of the sequentiality. There's no way to compromise the trusted setup to speed this up unless you're going to give faulty proofs. And if you're going to give faulty proofs, anybody can actually redo the evaluator's computation in the same number of steps as the evaluator to detect faulty proofs and people would stop trusting the setup right? if faulty proofs were ever discovered. But that's a theoretical VDF. In this work, we're going to look at concretely practical constructions. And we're actually gonna come back to the snark idea to see if that we can actually make the, the, the snark idea more practical combined with other ideas. So let me go back to another idea that's uh, already been talked about. It's a, a very sort of old idea in cryptography, um, and it gives a uh, it does give something that that is a sequential computation that has like a decent gap between uh, evaluation and verification. And this is the problem of computing square roots modulo a prime. So in this case, the challenge is going to be it's going to specify some you know, some, uh, some uh, prime uh, number. And the evaluation on a given challenge is to compute, if, if the challenge is a quadratic residue, which you can test quickly, if the, if the, quadratic res if, if the challenge is, is a quadratic residue, then you are, you're going to compute the square root of that mod p. You're going to find some x such that x squared is equal to c mod p. And if it's not, then 
the, then the inverse of, of, uh, of C is going, is going to be a quadratic residue, so you would solve for x squared is equal to negative C mod P. And uh, when P is equal to 3 mod 4, it turns out that uh, you can uh, do this, you can find a solution x just by exponentiating C to the power P plus 1 over 4, and that requires log of p sequential squaring operations. Note that there's actually two solutions, but there's a canonical way of choosing between them. On the other hand, verification is just one squaring, right? You just check, okay, well now we have a solution, let's square it, let's see if we get back the challenge. So there's this gap of log p versus one squaring between evaluation and verification. There's two ways to increase the evaluation time to tune it to a desired para uh, parameter. One idea, one idea would just be to increase p. The caveat of doing that is that when p becomes very, very large, then you're multiplying log p bit numbers. And the multiplication can be paralyzed. So for large p, it introduces a parallelism factor up to log p. And I'll talk about the ramifications of that on the next slide. But another way, if you are okay with the, the gap that you have between the verification and the evaluation, and you just want to amplify the evaluation time, and you're okay with blowing up the verification by the same factor, then you can just chain these square root computations, adding a simple permutation in between each step. Uh, this was shown recently in a paper by uh, Lenstra and Wesolowski in 2015. So asymptotically though, if we look at the non-optimized evaluation, it's actually complexity log p cubed, or log p multiplications of log p bit elements. And the optimized evaluation, which is especially relevant when p becomes very large, can paralyze the multiplications and get a log p speed up and therefore have log p squared parallel time. Now notice that that's the same complexity as the verifier who's weak and doesn't have a lot of parallel resources. And even though this verifier just needs to compute one multiplication of log p bit elements, it's asymptotically order of log p squared. So asymptotically, it's horrible. It just gets a constant gap between the optimized evaluation and the verification. So what we took a look at is sort of generalizing this idea. Square roots modulo a prime are an example of inverting a polynomial. We're finding, it's, it's, an, it's a polynomial where finding a root of the polynomial, x squared minus c is slow, but verifying is very fast because it's a, it's a polynomial that you, that, you can, that, 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 uh, that you can evaluate efficiently. So this motivates the problem of finding, uh, you know, can we have other examples of polynomial where there's a unique x such that the polynomial valued on an x is, is equal to the challenge. In other words, f of x minus c has a unique root. And finding the root is sequentially slow. And evaluating the polynomial on a given root is fast. And can we even achieve examples where there's an exponential gap between inversion and evaluation? So we took a look at permutation poly polynomials on, on a finite field. So let me just give you a few facts about per what permutation polynomials are. A permutation polynomial, it's a polynomial on a finite field which permutes the elements of the finite field. Uh, we say that the degree of f is, is the degree of the highest term. And the evaluation, if there are not so many terms of high degree, right, if, for example, if it's a sparse polynomial where most of the coefficients are zero, but it still has high degree, then the complexity of evaluating is just order of log of the degree, order of log d. Inverting permutation polynomials, on the other hand, can be done through a greatest common denominator problem of uh, computing the greatest common, common denominator of, of these two polynomials. Uh, it turns out that everything is a root of x to the q minus x over, over, over the field fq, and so finding, finding the unique root 
of f of x minus c just amounts to computing the GCD of these two polynomials. And uh, GCD is like basically it's like the Euclidean algorithm, right? So it, it involves inherently de-sequential degree reduction steps. However, on the, on the other hand, each step does involve de-arithmetic operations. So we have to keep that in mind. There is parallelization that is possible within each of these steps, but it does require de-sequential steps. Whereas the evaluation on a polynomial could be only log of d, which is exponentially smaller. Uh, there's also a fully parallel algorithm that uh, uh, uses order of d to the fourth parallel processors. So if we were going to use this for a VDF, we would have to assume that d is large enough so that d to the fourth or even just d cubed parallel processors is infeasible. So not all permutation polynomials require doing the GCD, right? A simple permutation polynomial is just x to the d minus c. And just, uh, just, just x to the d minus c, where, where d is coprime to the order uh, of the group, p minus 1. And in order to invert this polynomial, you just need to find the inverse of d mod p minus 1 and raise the challenge to this power u, and that will give you back x. So it's not the case that all permutation polynomials have this, have this characteristic. And so the permutation polynomial holy grail that we're seeking is one that has an arbitrarily large degree over a, a fixed base field, has a small number of high degree terms, or it's a, uh, you can evaluate it quickly, and there's no faster way to invert than computing the GCD. There's no better way than doing this sequential process that takes order of d sequential steps. So if we were to have this ideal permutation polynomial, then asymptotically, this would be wildly better than the square roots. Um, the optimized evaluator would be taking order of d steps. The verification would be uh, log of d. Also, the, the size of the output wouldn't blow up when we increase the, the, the delay parameter. It would be fixed at 256 bits, for example. The main problem is that the non-optimized evaluator is going to be d squared time. So, while asymptotically this is good, concretely, it's very good if we can assume that the prover is going to be running on optimized hardware which for many applications is an extremely reasonable assumption. In fact, if we look at a particular example of the parameters, um, on the left I have the square roots mod p. Um, for, for small primes, it, it, uh, it's, it's hard to optimize the, the log p multiplication. So this, these, these numbers are from, a, from the paper by uh, Lenstra and, and, uh, from 2015. Uh, and so the non-optimized evaluation took 10 minutes. The optimized evaluation, uh, they conjectured, would take no more than, uh, no less than two minutes. And verification was about a second. But you're kind of committed to this gap, right? There's about a, um, you know, a, a factor 100 or two gap between eval and verify, and you're not going to do better than that because asymptotically, as you increase the parameter and you introduce more, op more uh, opportunity for parallelization, you'll always have this, this constant factor gap between evaluation and verification. On the other hand, you can see here that if we were to, say, set the degree of the polynomial to 10 to the fifth, and we allow the prover to run on an NVIDIA Volta GPU, then uh, we can estimate that evaluation um, could be amped up to like almost two hours, whereas verification stays at one second. The problem, of course, is that a non-optimized evaluator would um, not, be able to, not be able to evaluate this in any practical amount of time. So we actually do have a candidate family that resists at least the, 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 the classical approaches to inverting polynomials that do not involve the GCD process. And um, it's kind of amazing that, the, that, that the, a polynomial of this type exists, that uh, for over any field, this gives a permutation polynomial for arbitrarily large degree that can be chosen independently from the size of the field. 
And, um, and, it, and uh, again, like when, when you have new assumptions in cryptography, you have to approach it with some kind of skepticism. So the, the concrete assumption here would be that there's no way to speed up the inversion of this polynomial other than the GCD process. And that's not as, uh, you know, as, as well studied a problem as other assumptions in cryptography. But this is our con candidate uh, family of permutation polynomials. So let me uh, quickly go back to the hash chain with incrementally verifiable snarks and see how we can actually use these new techniques to build a theoretically, uh, the theoretically complete VDF, one that satisfies the theoretical uh, definition but is more practical than just doing generic, incrementally verifiable snarks over a hash chain. So the new idea is to replace the hash function with something that's snark friendly, so that it, it's easy to compute snarks over it. But moreover, our suggestion is to replace it with something that's already kind of a weak VDF. And the reason is that the snark will then be built not over the evaluation of this VDF in the forward direction, but over the verification circuits in the reverse direction, which already has lower complexity. So roughly uh, speaking, uh, the, the, the snarks that we know of now, which are, which are used pairings, uh, the complexity for building a snark for a function is proportional to the arithmetic complexity over a field FQ. So we want snarks that are uh, that have low arithmetic. Uh, we, we want we want a VDF that has low arithmetic complexity over over FQ, specifically where the verification of the VDF has low arithmetic complexity. So this is again what the idea is, right? So you run the evaluation for several blocks to get an intermediate output, and then you prove that you've verified this intermediate output using the VDF verify function. And then the rest of the idea is the same, that you incrementally update your proof until you get a final proof. So let's say that we use these permutation polynomials as the VDF in the chain. The permutation polynomials are arithmetic over finite field FQ. We can set it to be the same finite field as the snark finite field because we had these wonderful polynomials where we could build them over any finite field we want uh, with arbitrarily large degree. So the snark verification would, the, sorry, the snark pr proof would be over evaluating the polynomial in the forward direction which was only log d complexity whereas the prover would be working in the reverse direction computing uh, the, the inverse of the polynomial. So concretely, with de degree 10 to the fifth, for 10 to the fifth evaluation steps that the prover has to do sequentially, or the evaluator has to do sequentially, they then only have to compute a snark on 16 arithmetic gates. So this is going to make the incrementally verifiable idea much more practical because the main thing that has to happen is that they, that they don't have to do so much extra work to produce this proof as they're doing the sequential computation. Uh, note that the, the verifying the previous NARC also is going to add some constant complexity, so you have to uh, sort of factor that in. So we can also try to do this for, the square, for using modular square roots. Uh, I want to compare the two approaches since at least modular square roots are based on a, on a cryptographic assumption that has been around for longer and is better studied. The problem is that if we just looked at modular square roots uh, over mod p, implementing multiplication over, mod, uh, over, over a different uh, field, right? If we're going to make p be some 1,024-bit prime and the snark field is only 256 bits, then we'd have to be implementing multiplication over a different modulus uh, in a circuit over FQ, and that is going to have high complexity. But we don't need to do that. Our new idea is instead of computing mod P, we can choose 
the same prime that's used in the field used for the SNARK, just fix Q, and we're going to compute square roots over an extension field of FQ. So basically this will be a field with Q to the power R elements, where Q is just fixed to be a 256-bit prime, but R we can make as large as we want. So if we're computing square roots over the extension field, it's the same kind of process as long as we choose Q to be uh, in, in a special way. Um, we can compute a square root by repeated squaring. And multiplication over this extension field just reduces to arithmetic operations on the base field FQ. Uh, we can even implement the permutation um, as arithmetic operations over FQ that are not arithmetic over, F, over, over the extension field. So that means that uh, so the gap between evaluation and verification can be blown up, okay, without affecting the base field that we're computing over. So we can achieve still this R log Q gap between evaluation and verification without changing the modulus Q, and we fix it to be 256. The thing is, if you look at the sequential number of steps for the highly parallel prover, for 10 to the fourth, say, evaluation steps, we're still going to have to end up computing a snark on many, many gates. Now, it's still better than evaluating a snark on what the, what the evaluator is computing, which it has like 10 to the 12th arithmetic ops, but it's not much faster than the number of sequential steps that this optimized prover has to, has to take. So the ratio that really matters, which is what makes the permutation polynomial so much more suitable for this kind of problem, is that the optimized evaluation parallel complexity, the ratio that matters is the optimized evaluation parallel complexity, which characterizes the sequential time that the prover is taking, over the circuit complexity of the verifier, which is what we're, what we're producing the SNARK for. So we have more ideas on this. We have um, ideas based on exponentiation in a group of unknown order. This is an old idea for how to uh, f f force someone to do a sequential computation. It's the basis of the time lock puzzles, uh, or the, the original time lock puzzles. Uh, and the idea is that, or the, 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 the cryptographic assumption is that if you choose a a, a, modulus, a modulus, which is the product of two primes, so it's unknown to the evaluator, then computing a power uh, of, of some element of uh, uh, you know, mod n is going to take sequential, is the, you can't do it faster than just sequentially square, squaring. So if you set the, the power to be really, really huge, like two to the, two to the sum difficulty parameter t, so that two to the t is much bigger than n, then the evaluator, since they don't uh, know the, the order phi of n of the group, they won't be able to reduce the modulus, and so they're just going to have to do t sequential squaring steps. Unfortunately, there's no good way to publicly verify a solution of this. Um, it turns out that if, if, you re if you reveal anything that takes into account the trapdoor information uh, for verification, such as you know, your RSA secret key, right? then you'll reveal how to factor n. But we have a construction based on pre-solving many puzzles in the setup. Uh, it requires the prover to have very large parameters, like one terabyte, uh, but the verifier doesn't have to have such large parameters, and the proofs are very short and fast. Uh, the trick here is to design this to resist pre-computation attacks. And um, I don't have time to talk about th this construction, but basically we do resist pretty large pre-computation attacks, but massive pre-computation attacks are still possible with this approach. So in summary, VDFs are this very powerful tool. There's many applications to blockchains and cryptography. They're theoretically feasible in this work. In this work, we explored some concretely practical approaches. And the ongoing work is sort of implementing and experimenting experimenting with these and, and, uh, and seeing how concretely practical they are. So thank you very much.